Hi, I'm Satin Brownie, and this is Finding Happy Podcast. Finding Happy Podcast is my journey to discovering my own happiness through conversations with other persons who inspire me in one way or another. This podcast is about connecting with self to create possibilities and opportunities for happiness. You deserve peace of mind. You deserve wellness. You deserve laughter. You deserve to smile. You deserve peace of mind. You deserve calm in your world. Your life isn't happening to you. You are life. Your happiness is not something you attain. You are. You generate happiness. You are your joy. You are the producer of your joy. You are the producer of your happiness. You deserve to be happy. So you go find it. Go find your happy at any cost. Risk it all for your own happiness. Find your happy. Thank you so much for joining me on Finding Happy podcast. I am Satin Brownie. Uh, today in our conversation, we're going to be speaking about parental relationships. I grew up with parents who didn't have great parents. I would say, or didn't get good parenting. Perhaps that's what I should say. Um, parents who I believe from my experience and what I saw, they didn't really know what love was. They didn't seem like people who really, really, truly experienced real love, being loved for who you are, for where you are, just as you are kind of love, you know? Um, and so I think it was a challenge for them to, to kind of give it to, to, to their child or to their children um, in the way that I guess the, the kids would, would desire it, certainly how I desired it, you know. I, my dad loved me. I, could, I, knew, I knew he loved me. Um, but my mother was a whole other story, you know. Um, but what I believe is, I believe that people are doing their best at all times. I, I believe my parents did their absolute best. It was their best that they were doing, um, regardless of whether or not their best was good enough. Um, I know and I'm confident and I'm satisfied that I believe they did their best. And I remember at 16, I wanted to divorce my mother and I remember the adults around me thinking, where on earth did you get that? Where did you get that from that you could divorce your parents? But I wanted to. Um, I, I, at 16, I was, oh, I, I hated her. At 16, I hated my mother so badly. I hated her. I remember being told she left when I was one year old. Um, I remember growing up without her, but I, I also remember... I remember it's like my father was looking for my mother because I would constantly ask about her. And I remember one night he brought me to this house and he said, we found your mother, we found her. And I'm going to take you to see her because I used to pressure him. Like I want to see my, my sisters and I really want to see my mother. Like I would talk about it all the time. And I remember when I got to where she was, to the house where she was. I don't think she was at the house. I think she was at work. She, she worked at a bar. And, but I remember when she came and she saw me. It's like imprinted in my mind. I think I was wearing like a white t-shirt and one of those black, I think you call those crepes. And I remember the toe was cut out because, you know, my foot was growing out of the shoe. It was, you know, my, my, my feet were growing. And I guess my father couldn't buy another pair, so he just cut the front out so my toes, you know, <laughs> were free. But I remember her saying to me, you look so black. Go to the back, go to the back. You need to go around, go to the back, go to the back, go around the back. That's what I remember. And as a child, I felt like all the fairy tales I told myself <laughs> about my mother was just shot, but I would spend my next years still wanting that relationship and wanting to feel like I belonged to her. That's what I wanted, to feel like I belonged to her. 
I remember before she passed, she was in the hospital and I went to see her. And um, at first she didn't recognize me. And I remember her friends were saying, yes, it's, you know, and saying who it was. And I remember when I sat in front of her and um, I had my cell phone and she took my cell phone and she stuck it under her tummy like and she held my hand and she put her her face and she lied she was lying down on my hand with her face and she just kept me there for a while I remember I wanted to because at the time I was living in Kingston and I wanted to return to Kingston but I couldn't move because I felt like I'm going to wake her up um, and I remember tidying her and it was the most amazing thing she looked exactly like me her body was a replica of my own. Mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, it it was it was um it still is shocking for me anyway. Um her fingers, her tummy, her vagina, her legs, her thighs. She was me. She looked exactly like me for a society to thrive it needs to have people who are able to cultivate and maintain quality healthy relationships and it is my personal belief from my own experience and my own um, um, upbringing that within the black community we are not um, good at building and maintaining quality relationships among ourselves. That's my personal opinion. You may disagree and that's okay. It's my personal opinion and experience. And so I am um, really exploring to learn more about other people's experiences and so I'm going to be having conversations with persons who are able to talk about their own experiences and um, I may share some of mine as well but I really do think that for us to become a wealthy healthy and thriving society we have to get to the place where we can have quality beneficial relationships with each other um, that are that relationships that are supportive um, relationships that are kind, re relationships that are rewarding and um, equally rewarding um, that we can be proud of, you know? And, and, and um, that is why I am focusing on relationships. Now, to start us out, I had a conversation with just a really lovely, amazing woman, professional, um, her name is Dr. Tanisha Burke. She was born in Jamaica, and she'll tell you her story. She currently lives in and, and works in Germany. She was such a pleasant person to speak to. The conversation was so easy. Dr. Tanisha Burke, she is a mother. She is a certified positive discipline parent educator, trained and certified fascinating woman teacher womanhood teacher and cross-cultural psychology researcher and lecturer. She supports young women, wives, and mothers from diverse ethnic backgrounds to help them navigate womanhood and parenthood. Wow, isn't that lovely? I, that's amazing. She currently holds a PhD in family relations and human development, an MSc in applied psychology and a BSc in psychology and international relations. I'm telling you, she's so easy to talk to, so pleasant and warm. She's one of the warmest persons I've met. Just, just, she's just so open and so comfortable and so confident, but in, in a way that is just pleasant. She's just warm and pleasant and open. And I, I loved this conversation and I most definitely want to have her on again and um, we'll be having her on again to have other conversations because I think she has such a wealth of knowledge and experience um, from her research and from her work. And I think um, she is a great example um, for millennials today and for us, any one of us, it doesn't matter what age you are. But I think you, it's, it's especially, I think women who have not yet started having children, it would be worth taking 
some of her courses, one or two of her courses, um, or at least hearing what she has to say. I'm telling you, she is phenomenal, phenomenal, simply phenomenal. I mean, I've been meeting such amazing women and leaders and men as well um, through this podcast, and it's just it's just mind blowing. It's, it's just amazing. <laughs> so let me start by welcoming you, welcoming you to Finding Happy Podcast. I'm Satin Brownie, and um, we have with us today Dr. T. Dr. Tanisha Burke, and she is Jamaican-born, correct? Yes, I am. Right? Awesome. And yes. I think it's from yes. Kingston. Yes. Well, <laughs> I was born in Kingston. Okay. I lived a little bit in Monique, St. Anne, with okay. my grandparents between yes. age three and nine. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to Kingston to live with my mom. You know, the typical Jamaican. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and now you live in Germany after living in Canada, you know, in yes. <laughs> I, love, I love the trotting. I absolutely love it. As a matter of fact, um, it was, I remember writing a poem called Trapped in My Life. Mm-hmm. And at the time I, I figured my entire world was the spot I was standing on. And it was so limiting. And it was traveling that really empowered me beyond my circumstances. Mm-hmm. So that's lovely. How does how did how did you how did traveling come about for you? Well, I think traveling came about because of my education. So I have how would I say it? I have gone against the odds. I guess people being raised um, from a low income family, people have said, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that because you don't have money. And I kind of figured out a way around that, which is to make sure I do very well in school and get scholarships and get grants. Yes. So yes, I'm not from a rich family, but I kind, I found a loophole, which is to make sure I, you know, study my butt off and get the grants and scholarships. So I did my master's and my undergrad at UWE, Mona, and I didn't want three degrees from the same university. Right. So I applied to do my PhD in Canada and I did get this PhD and it came with grants and scholarships uh, for most of the program. And um, yeah, I had to work part-time as well to finance it. And then while in Canada, you know, when um, potential professors are applying to the departments, they usually share the CVs with the graduate students. So, you know, the professor comes, they do their presentation to the department, the graduate students and the professors in the department can ask questions. And I'm looking at all these CVs and I'm seeing like grants for like 100,000, 50,000. And when I, when I research, I realized, oh, I can't get those grants because, um, I am not a Canadian resident or a citizen. And I'm thinking, how am I going to compete with these people when I finish school? Because these look really nice. Yeah, and then I remember when I was in, at UWE, I did an exchange program at University of Toronto and I thought, maybe I can do an exchange program in my PhD because some professors or some schools may actually prefer international experience more than having large grants. So I did apply to become a visiting researcher. And again, I got a visiting grant scholarship <laughs> I'll see. Uh, to, to, to Germany. And when I got here, I was also, in addition to researching, I was also teaching in the department. And at the end of my grant process, they asked if I had any plans to go back to Canada. And I asked, well, it depends. <laughs> and they offered me a teaching position and I've been here since. <laughs> That's fantastic. Let me just share with the listeners. You are a certified positive discipline parent educator. Yes. Trained and certified fascinating womanhood teacher. I wear many hats. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And cross-cultural psychology researcher and lecturer. Yes. That is phenomenal. Yes. But I, all- I, Yes. But all of that, but all of that is yes. just with the family. So wow. all, of, so everything I do um, focuses on the family. So there's another hat when I'm 
talking to parents in general, yes. they ask me what I do. Yes. I coined the term that I'm a family relationship coach. Love it. I, I, oh, we've never heard that. We've heard about life coach. Well, family relationship coach, you know what I'm all about. I'm about, I work mostly with women and I work in three areas, three core areas. Um, I assist women in building three core areas of their lives, which is relationship with self, relationship with your spouse or partner, and relationship with your children, if you have any. That's beautiful. So for me, if one of those pillars um, is weak, the other, two, <laughs> the other two will suffer. So the, yes. I, I am a big advocate for healthy families. And I think a lot of the challenges we experience now in relationships, especially with children, it's related to the instability in families, the unpredictability in families. And also, you know, lots of children are experiencing chaos and abuse yes. and a lot of anger and so on. So for me, I want to help women, women I work with, I let them know to work with me, you have to be a woman who strongly believes that you want to create, you want to build a healthy family for yourself. And you also want to create generational success and generational success is everything relating to the psychological well-being of you, your children, so that their children will also be well, the mental well-being, the physical well-being, and the, the financial well-being. People think about, um, think about generational success as only financial, mm -hmm. but for me, everything relating to the well-being of the family. So I don't, if you're not, if you're one of those women who is like, I just want to be strong, independent by myself, I'm not the person for you. <laughs> if you want to know how you can heal your childhood wounds so that you can attract a healthy man to create a family, then we can talk. Wow. If you're realizing that the spanking and the shaming and whatever, whatever other punitive discipline practices just not working, we can talk so we can go through a positive, healthy way of disciplining your children that is wholesome, that is kind and firm, that also teach them to be capable human beings and learning from their mistakes. So that's what I'm about. I am into... I will call myself building and maintaining traditional family. And I'm not going to go anywhere outside of that because I think that is so, so important now. Yes. Yes. How did you get to this perspective and this, but it sounds like you're on a purpose journey. Can I say that? Yes. I think How it's, you know, there? you know what? I will start with the fact that my parents got divorced when I was three because of the separation, you know, my mother had to rebuild her life. Um, she was, you know, a lot dependent on my father. So when he left, then she had to rebuild. And I went to live with my grandparents. And it's so amazing that living with them, I didn't see the benefit of it until now. Because my, my grandparents were um, very traditional. Uh, my grandmother's still alive, but my granddad died two years ago. But... Um, they're very traditional in their roles. And I, there are lots of things that I learned from my grandmother that I didn't see the benefit of until now, but I will, you know, describe that later. Mm -hmm. And then I went to live with my mom. She's a single parent, saw the struggles and everything. And then I became um, a single parent. And I remember the, the deficits, the void that I felt and then I, you know, became very um, concerned for my son. And as he grew, I realized that there were certain deficits as well, especially as a boy. There are certain things that he needs from a man. So I do not embrace this Jamaican phrase about my mother who fathered me. And because neither do I. <laughs> in raising, yeah, in yeah. raising a son. And I, because I'm a researcher, I notice everything yes in raising a son there's certain things that as a woman i cannot teach him you cannot I, gather him. I, I can i can tell him how to treat a woman mm -hmm. but how to be a boy who will become a man 
that needs i can't do that so i have been blessed i've been blessed to have um healthy men in my life from family and um my friends husbands and also i have a lifelong partner and he has just been an amazing influence for my son and i am seeing that it is you know so i'm looking for from my personal experience as a child seeing the struggle that my son went you know went through before i had my life partner mm-hmm. and i'm looking at it and i'm thinking a child needs a father and a mother right there are just certain things that i can give him as a mother that a father may not be able to give him and vice versa right. and then also doing the research and seeing that children from single parents they're just so much more susceptible to delinquency drug abuse not going to university and all of that and you know the important things that people don't talk about is the fact that girls who are in single parent homes you know i'm not ignoring the boys but it's more prevalent for girls who live in single parent homes it's easier for them to be sexually abused Wow. Predators, predators don't go after girls who have a strong, healthy father around. Mm-hmm. That's, those, that's too dangerous. He can get beat down. Right. That, that man can kill him. Yes. So he's less likely to want to target a girl who has, notice I keep saying, healthy. Healthy, yes. <laughs> healthy, <laughs> healthy yes. masculine father around when she is when she does not have that security around her the predators come in the form of mommy's boyfriend in the form of the pastor the mm-hmm. teacher and all that kind of thing and i don't think we really understand the extent i think maybe you know just throwing it out, out there it would be interesting to see a study looking at the girls who've been sexually abused and the family structure, Mm, you know, controlling like, okay, if you're from a single parent, you're from a nuclear family, what's going on there. It's very rare. It does happen, but it's rare for a father to sexually abuse his daughter. Right. It's easier for a stepfather to do it. Right. But looking at things like that, um, girls growing up in single parent homes are more likely to have sex early at an earlier age. They're more likely to um, experience teenage pregnancy, self-esteem issues. And then when you go into adulthood, you end up attracting men who, who are not emotionally available, who um, are just not committed to you. And then you don't understand why Searching it's because you, you, yeah, you keep attracting your father. Yes. So for me, it's like, there's, we can talk for hours. There's so <laughs> many aspects yes. of life. If we can fix the family, we can eliminate or reduce a lot of the challenges that we now experience in Absolutely. society. Absolutely. And so for me, I am advocating, yes, I have my own anecdotal experience, but I also have a scientific data that nuclear traditional families are important and if you're not part of a nuclear family you have to you know if you have a close extended family which is becoming rarer each day True. because people are moving away from each other mm-hmm. and you don't have the grandmothers and the aunties the, late and youth, ex- the, the, the older persons are experiencing the late youth so they're right. not around the way they used to be anymore yes so for me a lot of the self-esteem issues a lot of the behavioral issues that our children are experiencing there is a lack in the home and i can tell from a, i you know from the single mother kind of point of view i remember that i said to myself i'm not working outside the home and again you were talking about you know your um your whole thing about creating your life yes i always made a commitment to myself that i rather not have a car I rather not have a lot of material things, but I'm working from home. So I've literally created opportunities where I can work from home. So for, as a researcher, most of the time I am home, you know, coaching parents, I'm doing it from home. 
Right. And it's so funny because a year ago, around this time, my son said to me, you know, mommy, we may not have all the material things like what my friends have, but I like that no matter what, when I come home, you're always home. Wow. Because kids need the... I grew up with my father and I was told my mother left when I was one. So I totally get it, which is one of the reasons I wanted to cover this topic, right? <laughs> um, there is something missing when a parent is missing, I believe. And we're not saying that if you're in a single parent family, then um, your life is not ideal and, and everything's mm-hmm. wrong with you. We understand that circumstances sometimes result in that, but um, we should be clear that the, the, the best for the child's development. Yes, yes. What, what, I, what, what I say to parents, yes, I don't want you to feel guilty or ashamed of being a single parent we all go through things some people become single parent because a partner dies that's completely fine if what i'm saying if you cannot create that um ideal family for yourself it's important that you seek help from the opposite sex that is not there in you know like okay so for you're a single mom you have children, especially you have a son. You now have to say to yourself, who, which man do I have in my life? Who is a healthy man who can be an example right. to my son? So right. it might be your brother. It might be your uncle or, you know, you know yes. it might be somebody in the community. You can say to them, when you're carrying your son to Kote here, can you carry mine too? Right. Can you carry him to go put, watch a game? Can you carry him to consciously engage positively? Engage in because when yes. the thing is with, with it, you know, it's not like that the man is going to come to the boy and say, This is how you're supposed to be a man. But he's going to be observing yes. how that man interacts with his son. Yes. He's going to be observing how that man interacts with women, mm-hmm. or especially if he's married with, and has a wife, how he interacts with his wife. And children, we, as children, we consciously and unconsciously observe and absorb from our environment. And we don't even notice the benefit of it until um, we're older. And I'll give an example. When I was living with my grandparents, when my grandfather was home, my grandmother always stayed in the guest bedroom. And she had her knitting things, anything, her books, her puzzles. And she never went into the master bedroom when he was in there. And as a child, I could not get it. I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Hmm. I'm thinking that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, but let me tell you, yes. now that I'm in a partnership, I see men need their space. Then, you know, women, when we are stressed out, we need other women and we talk and we vent (laughs) and we carry on with each other and then we feel better. Mm -hmm. When a man comes in from the world, he needs an opportunity. That's why they say they go into their cave. Right. He needs that opportunity to think about, to strategize, to rejuvenate, whatever it is. And then when he's ready, he joins the family. My grandmother knew that and they were married until he died two years ago and growing up and seeing it, I didn't understand the value of it until I'm in a serious relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm saying where when you don't have the partner with you, you you expose your children to individuals or couples or families that have that so they can see it. My grandmother wasn't teaching me anything about how to right. take care of a man. Yes. But I, I observed that and it puzzled me as a child. Mm-hmm. But, you know, your male um, listeners will get it. Like yes. a man really needs to be by himself sometimes. And he will love that woman who allows him to have his to space have his to face. just chill, think, and mm-hmm. clear his head. Another example was like, I remember when I was 20 and my my grandparents had this 
nasty argument. I don't even remember the content of it. And at the end of the argument, I heard my grandma, I was fuming because I'm like, why is she allowing him to talk to her like that? And, well, you know, as a kid, you know, even though I was 20, you know, I, I knew for sure I couldn't get involved in it. Yes. And then at the end of the argument, I heard the ironing board pull out. When I opened the door, bedroom door, there's grandma in the passage ironing his clothes. Then she go in the kitchen, she make his breakfast. And she set out that she always set the table very formal, no matter what he's having. Right. So the breakfast table, she set up everything and he ate. And when he left, I was like, why the hell did you do all those things? <laughs> and I was fuming. And I remember she said to me, no matter what happened in your marriage, you never allow that to come between what you need to do as a wife. Wow. No, if I didn't live with my grandparents, how would I have learned that? How to do that? I would have probably learned something from TV that I cussed him out and let him starve. I know. Yes, yes. Based on so, what? The, correct, the culture. Yeah. So right. it, that's what I'm saying. I keep using the term healthy because some people will yes. say, yes, there are, yes, there are relationships that are not healthy. Right. I'm talking about the healthy ones healthy that can ones. be an example. They're not going to be dictating to your children to say, mm -hmm. this is how you're supposed to do, but your children are going to notice certain things and it might yes. seem trivial, right. but it's not until they get into relationships as adults, then they realize, then learn no. how to deal. Right. Then they remember like, hmm, yes, maybe that's a, a good approach. Let me try that one since I was exposed to it. How do mm -hmm. you think that parents can parent their children with this kind of mindfulness so they can have healthy relationships okay when i'm parent when i'm disciplining my son what guides me is i keep saying to myself i am raising someone's husband and i'm raising someone's father wow like now that. what i do now will impact how he responds to his wife and how he responds to his children. If I have a difficult relationship with him, if I constantly hurt his masculine pride, and we need to have a conversation about how women hurt masculine pride for boys and men and how it disrupts their relationship and sense of self. Mm -hmm. But um, if I continuously destroy his masculine pride, disrespect him, cuss him out, and importantly, beat him. Yes. How is he going to respond to his wife? Also, one of the things I keep talking about, I don't provide the safe space in my house to allow him to cry. When oh he becomes God. a man... I usually have that thing about when you beat a child... Mm -hmm. I remember seeing my mother beat her son, my brother, mm -hmm. and then turn around to him and say, what are you crying for? Stop crying and beat him some more to stop crying. And in my mind, I'm thinking this is a murder you're creating. Yes. You're teaching how because, to repress. And, but not only that, but then these boys become men mm -hmm. and then their wives think, I cannot get through to him. Why is he so cold? He doesn't show any emotions. But he learned that from childhood, it was yeah. unsafe to, ex to show his emotions. So he's not going to show his emotions unless he's been in a relationship with you for a while. And you have had the patience and you've proven to him yes. that it's safe for him to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Most men, they love us, you know. I think most women don't get that, that your man loves you. Interesting. <laughs> but he doesn't feel safe to be vulnerable with you because he was socialized that as a boy who then becomes a man he must be strong he mustn't cry he mustn't express his fears or anything so you are going through stuff in the relationship and you're saying he's cold he doesn't even care he doesn't even love me when it's far from the truth he does, wow. but we have conditioned our boys from a young age that it's unsafe to express themselves emotionally. And this is what I try to share with women, 
that yes, the world, mothers, yes, the world is a very unsafe place, especially for boys to share their emotions. You have to create a space in your home that allows him to cry. Let him cry and let him know, you know, when you're ready to talk about it, I am here to listen to you. And if you want some advice, I can provide it for you. But when he's in, you know, on the street, in school and whatever, he can't express his emotions. He comes home, he cannot express his emotions. Then what kind of man do you expect him to become? Yes. You know, it's, it's a serious thing. So that's why I say to parents, even if you're raising a daughter, so I keep going back to son because I have a son, but I also need to say too with daughters, you're raising somebody's mother and you're raising somebody's wife. No, the way you treat her, do you want her to treat your grandchildren the same way? Do you want her to cuss and belittle and beat the daylight out of your grandchildren? No. I understand that a lot of us as Jamaicans, Caribbean people, we were only exposed to one form of you know, discipline, which is to hit. And... So I understand that. But if you're open to, you must be open to say, you know what? There must be something else out there that I can learn. And I try to tell parents that building a relationship with your children is the most important thing in this generation. The most important thing. And let me tell you why I say that. When you and I were growing up, we were very much filtered because we didn't have any internet. Right. And I'll use the example of pornography. In order for us to be exposed to pornography, we probably have to find some uncle or cousin hidden cassette. Then we probably have to go wait till everybody out of the house to put in the cassette. So there were so yes. many barriers. So, yes. <laughs> to get now you can create the barrier for your kids in your home, but then there might be a kid from another home exactly. whose parents are not that vigilant. And this kid just come with a cell phone and say, Hey, look on this. Mm -hmm. And your child is immediately exposed. Now, if you're beating down on your child, threatening your child all the time, your child will not share that with you. Mm -hmm. And they will hide and they will filter information. And that is very dangerous these days. Yes. yes. So it means to build an, a relationship where your child opens up to you, you need to change your parenting pattern. What a are some of the things that they can do to, sorry, sorry to cut you, to yeah, yeah. Um, inspire that a connection with their child to have that? Because um, I think connection is missing. People, listen, parents are talking listen. and telling you what to do but okay like, that's what i was about to say right. that's what i'm about to say listen more talk and lecture less okay. now i will give you based on the developmental period so you know when children are in early childhood and you know a little bit in middle childhood we're still managing their behavior we're still telling them what to do what not to do as they're exiting middle childhood and entering adolescence and by the way the data shows that conf parent child conflict increase at the start of adolescence and there's a reason for that the child now wants more autonomy the child now is trying to find their sense of identity and the parent still wants to manage and when you manage what you do when the child is not doing what you want to do you you push you become more forceful and what that child is going to do is rebel you have to realize that as they move out of middle childhood to adolescent years, you have to shift from being a manager to being a coach, which means you have to stop telling as much and start listening more and use what I call curious questions. Because when children feel that they're going to be criticized, lectured, or judged, they're not going to open up to you. They're going to be fearful and you're not safe because they're like, oh, she's going to judge me. She's going to warn me. She's going to threaten me. You know, maybe I should just go Google this and see what Google tell me or ask my friends. Yes. Right. So you have to, I know it's hard for parents. And this is what I train parents in doing is to ask curious questions. So when they're talking about, say they're listening to certain music 
you instead of saying, Mina, why are you listening to that? What is interesting about that music that you like so much? Right. What message do you think that music is sending? Do you think that message is appropriate? How would you feel if you're on the receiving end of that message? Do you see you get children to start talking? Right. And sometimes they will problem solve themselves and say, you know what? This thing is not really for me. Mm-hmm. But would they have gotten to that point if we had lectured them? And I know a lot of parents are probably triggered and like, but, but you don't want them to, you don't want to lose control. And again, everything within boundaries. I'm not saying all of a sudden you allow your children to do anything that they want. You have to switch from beating your kids to allowing them to experience logical consequence and logical consequence meaning what happened relating to that particular behavior so i'll give you the example two weeks ago my son i always say to him do your homework days in advance because you never know what will happen the night before he didn't listen to me had to stay up the whole night to do his homework because he was so tired he forgot his homework and he called me to say he forgot his homework i'm like well you're going to have to turn back for it why can't I bring it? That's not my responsibility. You are supposed to manage your time well enough so that you know that you're supposed to pack certain things. But I'm going to be late and I'm going to be in trouble. I'm like, well, that's the consequence of not planning your time. Do you see the logical consequence? We have to start teaching children to, ex- you know, we have to start training ourselves to allow children to experience logical consequences of their actions you don't study you fail you reach late you get detention you don't go and beg for your child your child is disrespectful gets suspended they deal with the consequence you don't go beg for your child so they and in addition when you're doing that you're also teaching them you're giving them the skills to also become responsible human beings so you're teaching there's you see the life skills that are coming out of logical consequences now if you're having a challenge or you're having a challenge with your child then you have to do brainstorming with your child now what our parents do is usually tell us what to do yes and then we either don't do it or we do it halfway just to get them off our back (laughs) now Children are more likely to do something or buy into something when they have contributed Mm -hmm. to that decision-making process. So I advocate, you know, I always say to parents, it's amazing that when we work for other people or we have our own businesses, every Monday morning we have management meeting. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what the mission of the family, the the, the company is, the goals of the company, all of that. Why don't we do that for our families? Why aren't we, why aren't we that deliberate? Yes. So when you have family meeting, I actually have a course on Udemy and family meetings, actually. When you have family meetings, you're brainstorming every behavior. I don't have like resistant issues with my son because he will just put it in our agenda. Like I need to talk about this in the family meeting because I don't agree, right? When you have family meeting, you say as a family, we need to resolve this issue. Younger children, for example, they're not going to bed on time. Maybe you need to create bedtime routine in creating that bedtime routine. The children are contributing to what they can do just before bed so that they can go and go to bed on time. They're having sibling rivalry. You, you have brainstorming ish, um, sessions, you know, to see how you can resolve the differences you know, between the siblings or among the siblings and so on. So those are the kind of things. And when you do that kind of democratic approach, you don't have resistant issues. You do not have behavioral issues. I think a lot of parents are afraid that if I give up the punitive strategies, my child is going to go buck wild. That's they what I was going to ask. Do you think there's they a will only with control? The need to control? Yes. Because of the fear of if I don't control, my child is going to go buck wild. But the thing is, you have to see it as being on, you know, both ends of the spectrum. So punitive damage is um, punishment is on one end of the spectrum. Permissiveness, 
which is allowing your children to do anything they want, be anything they want to be, say anything they want to say without any form of consequence. Some parents think that if they give up the punitive thing, their children are going to become like that because they have dropped the ball. But if you drop the ball, it means you've now entered permissiveness. I'm not telling parents to be permissive. Instead of going to either end of the spectrum, you're coming into the middle. Right. It's the middle that you need to be parenting from. And our world, with all the things our children are exposed to, we really need to work towards going to the middle. Right, right. Right? Because when you go to the middle, you are having dialogue with your children. You're problem solving with your children. The quality of your relationship with your children will increase. You know, and through that, a lot, the thing is, you know, the data have shown, even in my dissertation, it shows like, when we create more opportunities to develop closeness, and what I mean by closeness is like, you are interacting with each other where no, there's no hierarchy, right? right? So it's, discipline is more of a hierarchy thing. You're enjoying each other. So you might be doing project together. You might be cooking together. The funny thing is the data shows across culture, cultures that when we create more opportunities for those experiences, children are more likely to comply to our requests because they feel a need to reciprocate. And inclusiveness. They feel included. Yes, they, they feel connected. Right. They feel connected. They feel a sense of belonging. So if we create more opportunities for them to experience that kind of closeness with us, they're going to be more agreeable. And if they're more agreeable, there's not going to be any need to discipline because guess what? They're going to comply. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it's a whole thing of coaching instead of lecturing, asking curious questions instead of lecturing again. So for example, go brush your teeth. Let me ask you, which one would you be more receptive to? Go brush your teeth instead of and then I say instead, what do you need to do with your little teeth before we go to bed? And there you might go. say, I oh, I need to brush my teeth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think you might need to do that now. As a child, which one do you think you'd be more welcome in? The latter. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. So it's, it's, you know, what I need to say too is our, our ways of parenting is we inherited it from slavery. And the challenge is after slavery, our great, 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 great grandparents were not re-socialized in how to interact. Mm -hmm. So it's, what we're, we're still having is more of a mass slave, master slave yes. kind of mentality. Yes. yes. And yes. It is ruining our children. Mm -hmm. um, so the example that um, Professor Joy DeGru gave all the time, and we as Jamaicans can relate to it, right? Do you notice that as our parents never ever really brag about us in public? Yeah. Or if somebody, or if no, if somebody says something really nice about us, Mm -hmm. Like, oh, she's so smart. She get all those A's. Yeah, but I have a woolly pet behavior problem yeah. with her. Yeah, always like do, dark do you, seekers. You, yes. Yeah. The, thing, the thing that we don't realize, you know, it's coming from slavery. Yeah. Look at it this way. The slave master come and see your daughter in the field. And he's like, whoa, she's maturing really mm -hmm. nice, man. Mm -hmm. You That's as a different. mother, you're protecting your daughter yes. from possible rape. Yes. You're protecting her from possibly being sold. Yes. So you're going to say, no, man, she doesn't have mind. no sense. Right. She doesn't have no sense. She's an idiot. She dropped everything. Mm -hmm. Your child is hearing that, but you're doing it to protect your child. Mm -hmm. Now, after slavery, parents just kept doing it and doing it. Now, during yes. slavery, it was an adaptive behavior mm -hmm. because it was necessary a to keep your mood. Yeah, it was necessary right. to keep your child, you know, under you, under, you know, in your yes. eyesight yes. without being raped or sold. It was, so you needed to do that for the family to stay together. Mm -hmm. It has now become maladaptive because you're no longer in that kind of survival space. 
Mm-hmm. And your child is like wondering, so she can't even tell me such a proud of me? Right. Without even talking about how my room dirty? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so yeah. now that kind of behavior is maladaptive. So I also try to show parents that, yeah, we inherited this thing from our forefather, fathers, but it was necessary then right but no keep longer. your kid and prevent your child from being sold right or go through any form of abuse in the slave master's house mm-hmm. but now we don't need to be that way it's okay to say to a child you know you you compliment the the behavior so i don't believe in praises because praises is like oh you're a good child mm-hmm. that kind of thing so the child will not want to do anything that will quote unquote be bad Right. What you say instead, um, instead of saying you're a smart kid, so data also show that, for example, when you say you're so smart and then you say to another child, you've worked so hard, you know, I'm proud of all the effort you've given. When these two children are given complex tasks to do, the one who is told that he or she is smart will not want to complete the task because it might run the risk that it might be or proven failure. that they're not so they're not so smart. Yes. The one who was encouraged based on their effort is more likely to try. So I say to parents, don't say to your child, oh you're so smart. Say instead, wow, you've put out a lot of efforts. I I, I appreciate that effort. I look at how what the effort you have done, look at the results. And even if your child has failed, I think children now do not want to take the risk even with academic stuff. Oh, goodness. Because they're, fa- they're afraid, they're afraid of, failure. of failure. Oh, my goodness. But we, but we never really truly learn and evolve without no, failure. Really. We have to teach them to fail forward. Yes. Yeah, so, what, you, know, you know, what can you do differently next time? What did you learn about this situation? Having the conversations. Yes. So it's mm-hmm. for me, it's, you know, a lot of, I know parents might be thinking, Lord, that's a lot of things, but it's more of having, using curious questions instead of demanding stuff, not lecturing your child, not criticizing, not judging your child, but hearing what they have to say. That doesn't mean that you don't communicate your values. You can say, mm, that's very interesting, but you know that in this family, we value right. that make, people don't the swear. Them. Like, yes, like, yes. Yeah. Make, you know, in this family, we don't swear to each other. And yeah, it's okay if your mm-hmm. friend's family is okay with that, but in this family, we don't. Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, you know, instead of doing it in a demanding way. Yes. Having family meetings where you brainstorm. So when you come up with solutions, are they helpful? Are they reasonable? Are they related to the particular problem that they're having? Mm -hmm. And then you choose the best solution for a problem and you try it out for a week or two. If it doesn't um, work, then you try another one. But, and also allowing your children to have logical consequences. Um, the whole thing with our culture and spanking, there's, there's research out there that shows that children who are spanked, they actually mature faster. It is like the body is coming from evolution. It's coming from evolution. It's like the body is saying, this environment is dangerous for me, so I need to quickly develop so I can, so I can, re- so, no, so I can reproduce before I die. Oh, wow. Really? Yes. That is interesting. And also when you keep on beating your children and their fight or flight mode is coming from the primitive form of the brain, right? The first form of the brain that developed hundreds of thousands of years ago. Yes. Now we need in, in at Magdala, you know, you needed that. We still need that to protect us. So we know when to fight, when to, when to run away. Fight. When you have a child in a home that is, constantly in a fight or flight mode right the cortisol level in that child is so heightened they are constantly stressed and there are so many negative effects on that as it relates to their cognitive abilities their ability to self-regulate their emotions their behavior and all of that 
And then you go into the whole punishment too, where the curiosity, the standing up for yourself, you don't want to do that because it's not safe. Mm -hmm. Then you have these children become adults and then they comply so easily because they were conditioned by their parents to really comply. Yes. And a lot of people say, but I got, I got beaten and nothing wrong with me. And I'm like, really? Nothing you can, you can how, touch that's tangible to you, but it's right, but, but how, manifesting in your relationships. Yes, exactly. How is it, how are you showing up in your relationships, whether it's right. with your boss, and, your right. spouse, or your friends? Can you truly be authentic? Mm -hmm. For example, a lot of people lie a lot in their relationships. They lie a lot. And when I counsel women on that, they grew up learning that it wasn't safe to be, to, to be authentic. Yes. It wasn't safe to be yes. truthful because they would get their butts whipped mm -hmm. for just being their authentic self. Yes. So they have learned that it was safer to lie and being manipulative and then yes. they bring that into adulthood that's true that is so okay true. and then you go back now to the whole spanking thing um my son said something to me that was so important and um i heard a man um you know a friend who worked with prisoners said as um something related to it but my son said to me mommy you know that if you were the kind of mommy to hit me i think i would grow up to hate women he said that to you at what age? He's, he was like 11. Wow. It was last year, I think. Wow. And it got me thinking, like, how many men just have this deep-seated wow. anger towards women and they don't even know where it's and coming from? Yes. And I, uh, you know, I, um, I remember maybe two years ago, um, a friend of mine, Kevin Wallen, he, he works in the prisons in Jamaica. And he said that all the men that are, you know, that he interacted with, he mentored in the prison who were on life, basically. Yes. They all had mothers who Mother physically issues. abused them. And I'm not going to make father scapegoats here, right. listeners. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there are certain long-term effects that how we discipline our children, we, we, they become angrier people. Yes. They're more likely to become delinquents. They're more likely to experiment with drugs. And then you have all the other relational issues. Yes, yes mothers, the reason why, let me tell you why mothers spanked their children in slavery. Mm. It's coming from that. If the overseer or the slave master spanked your child, they could put or beat your child. They could possibly kill him or her. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times the mothers would volunteer mm -hmm. because they will still hit their kid hard, but, with but they will not hit their children to the point that there are any long-term damages or possible wow. death. No, that was necessary because you're trying to save your child's life. And after you beat your child, you will go and dress the wound and tell him it's okay. Right. And breathe a sigh of relief that thank God did, you know, the overseer didn't beat my child because that could have mean possibly death or some right. broken limbs or something that was necessary. Then it's necessary. mothers, it's not necessary. No, it's not. Do you think how, how, do, how, how can, parenting evolve in the black community who needs to do what for that i think it's it's a whole re-socialization with the the parents and for me instead of just telling them that they need to change the things that i explained to you also need to be explained to them mm -hmm. that it was done by our forefathers so they can because, understand where it's coming from Yes. yes. And then to also explain to them that, um, you know, I saw some literature when I was doing my qualifying exams for my PhD, that actually before colonizers arrived in Africa, children were not hit. They were not, they were actually, they were, they were considered closest to God because they were so pure. 
Right. And so they were so cherished mm -hmm. that you didn't want to harm them in any way. So discipline was, you know, from a place of love and it's not yes. beating and shouting and saying, you know, I hate you because I love you. That part came from slavery. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if we're, I, I try to let black parents know that you're not conditioned forever to hit your children mm -hmm. before colonizers show up our ancestors did not ancestors did not do that yeah do you right? think um today's parents i'm sorry did i cut you off no 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 i was just saying that is to understand mm -hmm. the background of that yes. and then to explain to them what's happening in the brain yes. what's happening in the body when there's high level of stress Mm -hmm. what happens in the relationship that you have with your children and the kind of relationship that they will have as adults. Right. And it's just not worth it. No. So I, you know, for me, change is not shaming parents and telling right. them they're evil and telling them they're this and that, but it's educating them to say, you know what? You did the best you could with the information and the knowledge you had. Yes, yes. Now it's time to learn something new. Because you have the opportunity. It's going to, yes, it's going to be scary. There are certain times you're going to take 10 steps backwards when you only take two steps forward, and that's okay. Yes. But you're learning a new skill that will change the trajectory of your lineage because if you change the way you interact with your children that will influence how they interact with their children and so on and so on so for me cussing them and telling me you're evil and you're wicked and all of that yeah you know you know um rudolf dreikos he's um you know um following the the adlerian psychology and he said he doesn't understand why we think that it is effective to make children feel bad for them to do good. <laughs> that where is, where, where is the that logic? I'm... So hold on. Yes, so that, yes. that's the same thing I'm saying yes. regarding with parents. Mm -hmm. Where do we think we need to make them feel horrible for being horrible parents and expecting them to change? Positive. Right. Mm -hmm. if we're, and I think if we really stop, even the parents were doing it, if they just stop for a second and think about it, it really doesn't add up. Yeah, but that's, but that's also hard. I can understand that's also yeah. hard. Yeah. We have, not, we have not been trained to be reflective a lot as a people. Hmm. Like, how is my behavior affecting yes. me? How is my behavior that, affecting that's my profound. children? That is... That's we, 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 I, you know, yes. most, most of us, most of our behaviors, um, on autopilot. Yes. We, and they have that it's passed and we'll move on. You know, but the thing is we function mostly from the subconscious. Yes. And that's what people don't realize. Exactly. exactly. So you have to be gentle in yes. changing the subconscious in the parent yeah. than changing to the child. So for me, mm -hmm. it is possible to change, but it's explaining to parents why certain things were necessary. Mm -hmm. why they aren't know and what they can benefit you know from as it relates to the relationship that they have with their children when they go with an approach that honors a child's agency that honors a child's autonomy but at the same time that child is still navigating within boundaries and you're not losing control yes yes my mm -hmm. final question for you is how do parents consciously parent their children in a way that their ultimate goal is to ensure that that child, child experiences happiness and lives a meaningful life? Um, you have to parent in a way that you teach your child to be capable. And that means that you don't save your children I think modern, especially the younger parents, we don't want our children to feel pain, disappointment, rejection, sadness, all of that. Then they become adults who cannot function in the adult world. It's okay for your children to experience rejection and pain and all of that, especially from friends. The important thing is the support that you provide for them. 
Yes. I know it sucks. You can go back. I remember a time when I was, you know, I lost my best friend because I said something about her that I shouldn't have said. And I was so sorry. I know where you're coming from. And, you know, saying that to your children mm-hmm. and saying, you know, these, this is some of the things you can do to help you to shift from that kind of negative feeling. Also in making them feel capable is allowing them to experience the consequences of their actions. So I've always said to my son, listen, you can do anything you want to do. You know, you have free will, but you need to ask yourself, can I live with the consequence of my actions? Because my mama will not be saving me. (laughs) Exactly. So when you, when you, um, allow the thing with spanking, you're beating a child and telling a child not to do certain things. But a lot of times we miss the thing like you're supposed to do this instead. When a child, yeah, but when you, when you allow a child to experience the logical consequence of their actions, they then get to a point where they start thinking before they act. Yes. They start like, you know what? I don't think that's worth the trouble. Right. So it's teaching them to be capable human beings. Right. And that informing is, them of their options. So you're not just yes. telling them what not to do, but also tell them what could they have, what are the potent, possible um, options? Mm-hmm. What are the other things you could have done? Yeah, mm-hmm. that, that's it. Yes. And to build more healthy human beings who will become adult human beings, mm-hmm. especially our boys' mothers. Again, let me go back to the research. Boys, as they get older, they experience less affection and they experience oh. less love. Yes, because mm-hmm. parents, like, they don't hug them up that much anymore. Really? So what about the mama's boy thing? The whole thing? No, 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 no. That's mama's, boy, mama's boy is when you go and save your son and you don't allow him to be responsible. Okay, so it's that's not different. necessarily give. Wow, that that's it's not it, it's not necessarily the affection. It's um okay. just doing everything. And when you do, and the thing, parents, that you need to realize when you do everything for your children, you're telling them, "I don't trust that you're capable enough to do it on your own." Wow, that's that is what your community. That's what we are communicating with your child. That, I don't trust that you can figure this out on your own. Mm -hmm. So I am going to do it for you. Right. So instead of self-reliance, you rely on me. Yes. And then they go into adulthood and not knowing how to cope cope on their own, not knowing how to problem solve on their own, not knowing to, not knowing how to regulate their emotions because you have rescued them from everything you did not allow them and to be capable and when children feel capable their self-esteem go up Mm -hmm. and just the whole they value themselves go up because like yeah i can do this thing yeah i can yeah i'm good but when they don't the thing is you know you develop confidence not from a place of comfort right but from a place your confidence come from overcoming this comfort so that you know like um living in germany now the example i give with my son when i just moved here i was like oh my god i think i made the worst mistake because he wasn't adjusting well he didn't have much friends because of the language and then eventually he just got it and he said to me if I can learn German, I think I can overcome anything. Oh, oh goodness. Wow. And a lot of parents would be like, you know, this is so difficult. I think we made a mistake. Let's leave. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's what I'm saying, that you have to allow your children to develop that sense of being capable. Mm-hmm. And to build healthy children who will become healthy adults, as all human beings, they need to have a sense of belonging and they need to have a sense of connection. Now, I will say a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. It doesn't mean you pick me bad. Let me repeat. (laughs) A misbehaving child is a discouraged child. There's a reason for that in this car, There's a reason for that behavior. 
they have a goal to connect with you in some way, but it's coming across in a negative way. So for example, power struggles. The child is trying to connect with you with power struggles by back talking, you know. And the reason they're back talking is like, in the child's mind, I only feel a sense of being mattered when I exercise my power. I only feel heard when I exercise my power. I only get my views and perspective accepted when I exercise my power. That's coming from a place of discouragement. Wow. So we have to make the shift and understand when your child is misbehaving. I have a whole course. I think I'm going to do an online course so people in Jamaica and everywhere can get um, access to it. But when your child is misbehaving, they have a particular goal. And once you figure out that goal, you know how to respond. Yeah. So like when a child is back talking, that mistaken goal is, you know, a power struggle right. because I'm only heard or I'm only accepted when I show my, my might. You can simply say, you know what? I can't force you to do anything. I realize you're a human, you're an independent human being. I can't force you to anything, do anything. But you know what? I would really appreciate your help right now in moving this furniture. It would help me a lot. Mm-hmm. Which child wouldn't want to do it, even a teenager? Right. right. So it's, it's, it's um, realizing that to build capable human beings who are going to be adults, children always want to feel a sense of belonging and connection. Children need to feel capable. If you can do those things within a relation, a loving relationship, you will end up having human beings who are more empathetic to people, to others, who are more accepting of others, um, whether it's their views and perspective and so on, who have a higher level of self-esteem, who have, and most importantly, have a better relationship with you. Wow. But it takes, that, it takes that shift. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's like what I say to parents is that you are literally going through a re-socialization process right and sometimes you're gonna feel feel like I fail this sucks I don't think I'm getting through to my kid and another time you're going to be like yeah this feels good but don't expect it's going to be a quick fix you've been socialized all your life to function a particular way and making the switch to more of a um, democratic approach is going to now become a lifelong journey. There's sometimes you're going to take three steps forward, five steps backward, but that's, that's okay. But just have empathy for yourself yes. and rem- remind yourself, parents, if it's a boy, I'm raising somebody's husband and I'm raising somebody's father. If it's a girl, I'm raising somebody's wife and mother. I love that you- concept. Yeah, if you can remember that, Mm -hmm. you will stop yourself from doing and saying certain things to your children because you will think, boy, I really don't want my children to be like that with my grandchildren. That's right. Yes. You know, so you become more self-aware. Yeah. Wow. This, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to have you back. This was so, it was such an enlightening conversation. And, um, it's so uplifting to hear mm-hmm. it. And I know that the black community needs to hear it. And I'm not saying that the white community, community doesn't. It's just that because of our history and, and mm-hmm. the things that we, we, we adopted or learned as we were growing up, there hasn't been a, we need a paradigm shift of sorts. And I, I think coaching, and I, before we go, I would really love for you to share your details, where your courses can be, where they can access your course, courses, and mm-hmm. how they can access your services. Okay. So because I'm in Germany, everything yes. is online. online. So it's, you know, my website is, you know, my name, which is Tanisha Burke.com. So it's Tanisha can spell several different ways. So it's T A N I E S H A. B-U-R-K-E dot com. Um, I have a course on family meetings that's on Udemy right now. So U-D-E-M-Y dot com. You put my name in there, you'll see it. Actually, Udemy is having... I'll share a, all uh, the links with the video. Yeah. Okay, the thanks. Podcast. Udemy now has 
a Black Friday sale. And I also have, um, we would have to have a different interview on this though, but I have a course on marriage relationship success right. that's on Udemy. Yeah. Again, so, you know, I would highly recommend that course for women who especially were raised in single parent homes where you did not get to learn about understanding men. Yes. <laughs> that I was... studied I to study relationship. As a matter of fact, what I did um, when I was in university, I took a course, it was called Growing the Developing Child to, to help me overcome the, or understand why my mother wasn't there. Yeah. And when yeah. I did that course, I thought to myself, every student, this should be mandatory, like math mm -hmm. and English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For everybody to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So so I have that course on Udemy and then every everything else is on the, the website, um, tanishabert.com. Here in Germany, I am doing in-person parenting workshops. Yes. But if there is um, um, a demand for it mm -hmm. to be done online right. with persons in the Caribbean and North America, I'm also open to that. Awesome. Um, yes, but once you go to my website, parents, you don't have to do, if you want to do one-on-one -on -one coaching, I also provide that. So for a lot of families, they are like, um, let's have um, a coaching with you, five sessions, and I will go through the same, you know, the same steps, like yes. problem solutions. Right. And they can learn the techniques and the skills. Yes, yes, and yes. You, and so, you're, you're better able to customize it for the, the, fa the unique family because it's right, not a right. one size fits all. Yes. Right. So, so I also um, provide family coaching and... Um, at the moment, it's at the end of the year, but I'm not doing it now. But next year, I'll start it again mm -hmm. where I have group parenting. So a lot of, a lot of families can't afford the one-on-one -on -one coaching, yes. but I have a group parenting coaching. So I have 10 families, 10 parents. Um, they go through the different workbooks um, for six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, or say for 90 days and once a week, we meet on Zoom, for example, yes. um, for an hour or two. And this is where parents are supporting each other. Everybody has a challenge and, you know, other parents are helping this parents to problem solve and get them to come up with a solution for their family. Yes. That's also available and again, we'll restart in January. Thank you so much, Dr. T, for joining me on Finding Happy Podcast and for having the conversation with me about um, the parent-child relationship and how parenting influences a child's capacity and capability to have healthy relationships. It was such an absolute pleasure having you on the program. And my hope is that whoever hears this podcast will be empowered by the information that was shared. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, stick around. We get back to you next Thursday with a brand new episode. Um, we're going to be continuing our conversations on relationships. We're going to be talking to some single people to hear their thoughts and their ideas and um, just get some insight into where they're at and what their desires are. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Have a great, fantastic, amazing day. Thank you so much for joining me on Finding Happy. I'm Satin Brownie. Goodbye.